Thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Martin Cameron. I'm the head of our tax credits and incentives group, uh, known as tax incentives and incentives, tax credits incentives advisory here at Chariot Becker. Uh, we have a group of about uh, 50 plus people focused on a variety of incentives, many of them Inflation Reduction Act specific. Um, and I'm joined today by uh, three of my colleagues and one of our esteemed leaders um, in our in our industrial consumer goods practice. So why don't I uh, give my team a moment to introduce themselves and we'll get into the, to the discussion. Everybody, my name is Jason Hodell. I'm the industrial and consumer goods leader here. Our mission is to focus on everything from industrial manufacturing through running consumer brands. Um, I started my finance career at JP Morgan and mergers and acquisitions in the 90s, but I really have been an operator for the last 22 years. And the last decade was spent running a company called Skull Candy, making headphones. And we manufactured 20 million headphones a year in Asia and ran a global brand. And we were the Walmart CE supplier of the year in 2022. And I joined Cherry Beckert uh, last year. So thank you for coming. Hello, everyone. Uh, excited to be here. My name is Tim Doran. I am a director in uh, Cherry Beckert's TCIA practice. Um, I, I focus my work on energy tax credits, um, uh, specifically those uh, that were uh, enhanced and some of the new ones that we got in the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, I also joined Cherry Beckert last year. I have a background uh, in-house counsel in uh, the utility and energy space prior to coming over here. So I'm excited to bring that expertise and knowledge uh, to our clients. And I'm uh, David Mohamani. I'm a manager in our tax credits group. Uh, I've been Cherry Beckert for a little less than a year now. Uh, I have a background in tax equity structures and the financial modeling of those. Um, and I assist him with all of our efforts, uh, Inflation Reduction Act related. All right. Thanks, guys. And thanks, everybody, uh, for joining today. Um, continue on with our slides here. All right. So first polling question today. It's the easiest one. How did you hear about the webinar? Um, one, was it a Cherry Becker tax advisor, an email from us, a friend or colleague, uh, somebody who's an alum, or uh, from a social media post? Um, let me just get to this really quickly. I want to fill in a little bit of less, less than filler here, but while we're filling this thing out, um, one of the reasons we're going to have a number of, we'll call it Inflation Reduction Act or energy related webinars this year. Um, I think this one was the most important that I wanted to get on the calendar in combination with Jason um, due to the fact that what we're going to talk about today is one of the incentives called 48C. Um, and, and that is particularly time sensitive. Um, and, and David and Tim will get into more of the nuances of it. But um, later this year, there will be an announced uh, time period to submit what's known as a concept paper to the DOE. So it's an actually an, unlike many of the Inflation Reduction Act credits, it's actually an application-based credit. And so there's pre-work to do uh, during a specific time period. It all, it's almost in the form of a grant. And so that's why we wanted to do this now. All right. So let's, that's some of the context here of what we're going to be doing this year. And um, let's move on. Thank you all for filling out the polling question. Okay. So our agenda today, we're going to do a little bit of an Inflation Reduction Act overview uh, not too deep, but and, and a little bit of our approach as well here at Cherry Beckert. Um, and then we're going to talk a lot about 48C, which is the credit for advanced energy projects, which is the application-based credit about which I was speaking, but also 45X, which is known as the advanced manufacturing production credit. These really are uh, in line with Jason's world here of being our industrial leader. Um, and so it's it's just wonderful, again, that, that he's able to participate and work with my team so much. Um, because energy is quite something when it comes to what we're talking about with many of our industrial clients these days. But beyond that, um, and the tax credits and are just a piece of that. But I think it's an important piece. And again, this is a little time sensitive today. So that's why we're talking about it. All right. I think Jason and I will both go over this, but let's just talk briefly about the Inflation Reduction Act. It was signed in 2022 and really became effective in 2023. It has a variety of items that were in there beyond energy, but from an energy perspective where we're focused today in a credit perspective, um, it really um, both created some new incentives and reinvigorated some that were um, that were in the code for a while, but starting to phase out. Again, we're focused a lot on the investment in renewable technologies such as solar wind, geothermal, combined heat and power, um, and that had been there for a while. But uh, nuclear, nuclear facilities, carbon capture, and then what we're going to talk about today is investments in certain 
manufacturing facilities. Um, also, we're going to do a, as well another webinar on this later. But one of the most important things that happened in the Inflation Reduction Act is these credits that were both enhanced and created. Um, oftentimes in the past, developers or those that would qualify for some of the energy related credits didn't have a tax liability um, against which to use them. So they would have to engage in certain sometimes complex trend, like part of tax equity investment transactions and partner with other investors who would want to buy those credits through the operation of a partnership. They, it has been significantly simplified and uh, there's now a registry for um, developers or companies that um, might generate a credit due to the investment in some qualified technologies and actually put them on a marketplace and sell them to investors, well, sell them to companies that have a tax liability. Um, also, Inflation Reduction Act was very important because it expands the number of entity types that can take advantage of certain credits and incentives, specifically by creating what's known as a direct pay regime uh, for both, uh, we'll call it like governments that are not the federal government and also not-for-profit entities. So right now we're also talking to a number of uh, not-for-profits about investments they may have made in uh, some of these technologies in order to get a direct payment from the government as opposed to a tax credit. Um, again, we're gonna talk about 48C. It reinstated 48C um, and enhanced it as well. 48C was, there was a similar regime application base that um, right after the financial crisis was put into place in two separate rounds. So 12, 13, 14 years ago. Um, and um, again, we're gonna talk about 48X. It created this credit for the production of clean energy components, unlike investment tax credits, production tax credits uh, are taken over a period of time. And this is one of the first ones that is not specific to, to um, generating energy and selling it to the grid. It's actually for the production of certain components and selling them to unrelated parties. So it's it's a new concept around uh, production tax credits and it's an exciting one. And that's what we're gonna spend some time talking about today. Also, some credit boosters as well, um, to the extent you are paying those that are working on the technology implementation in what's known as a prevailing wage and they have an apprenticeship requirement. That's an analysis that has to be done in order to maximize the credit. Additionally, um, there are credit boosters for things like domestic content utilized in um, in the implementation of, of the project and also uh, certain energy communities as well can help you if, it's, if it takes place there, can generate additional credit for you. But Jason, um, happy to get some of your thoughts here too as we move into your, your section here. Marty. So just to speak to the issues that are on the minds of CFOs and CEOs and why this is really important. Well, number one, there's very few opportunities in your business life when over half of your capital expenditure can come back, come back to you in the form of cash in a very short period of time. And it's underwritten by the federal and state governments. Like that's a big opportunity. It's lucrative. It creates value. But number two, and perhaps more important for planet Earth, um, it's not optional anymore. Everybody has to take energy efficiency seriously. And Marty, if you go to the next slide, the list of organizations and uh, you know governments that are forcing companies to report their carbon footprint every day, it gets longer and longer. So you know, here's the quick mental checklist. California gets credit for kind of leading the way in the United States last year. They passed two laws, and the threshold there. It's capturing folks is if you're greater than 500 million in global revenues, global, not California, and you touch California in really any way, you're caught and you need to publicly report your carbon footprint. And the meter on that starts at the end of this year. So it's right in front of us. Well, California was really piggybacking on what the European Union and the global standards have done for a couple of years now. Europe's ahead of us on this issue. And California followed behind that. And then sure enough, just a few weeks ago, the SEC published their standards. And the SEC standard, it mirrored the second California law, which was making scope one and scope two reporting mandatory. And just to uh, cut through that, scope one is simply the carbon footprint of the assets that you own. And scope two is the calculation of the electricity that you buy, the carbon footprint for it. OK, and the SEC followed suit. Now, there's been some court action and we'll have to watch how that goes. But here's another piece. There's an executive order already out on the entire federal government contracting supply chain. 
And they're following on with the president's order that, hey, we are going to be net zero by 2050. Okay. Now we can get to net zero through a combination of reducing our actual operating footprint, carbon footprint, and carbon offsets. Okay. That's interesting. And we, Cherry Becker, we help people figure out how to do that. But the next one, big retail, there is no carbon offset with big retail. If you supply into Walmart or Target or Amazon, or you're in the supply chain of big manufacturers, you know, auto has already started this. They want to know the carbon footprint of what you're selling in retail or the part that you're putting into that car. And those questionnaires are going out and it's not optional. If you don't do it, it might impact your business. So all of a sudden this became pretty serious for CFOs and CEOs. Um, myself, this hit Skull Candy a couple of years ago and it became real. So you know, for pretty much any materially sized company, you're in a supply chain or you're big enough that you have to report, this is uh, a reality. Thanks, Marty, go ahead. Great. Okay, so let's get real, okay? Let's go ahead and define what a classic Cherry Becker type client might be facing as a choice because they wanna get more green, help save planet Earth, they want to reduce their carbon footprint because maybe they're filling out a carbon questionnaire for an auto supplier, very common in the Southeast. So, you know, let's look at this manufacturer. Well, the average electricity bill, it's about $6 million. Okay. And at current pricing, that's about 60 gigawatt hours in a year that you're purchasing. And if you do the math on how long that manufacturing facility is running, that's roughly 20 megawatts of power in the moment that they need to power up their facility. Okay, good news. Solar arrays are uh, way cheaper than they were just a few years ago. Today, that 20 megawatt in the moment solar array, it's cheaper than $1 a watt. It's about 80, 85 cents, depending on where you are. That's great. It used to be three to $4 per watt. So, so all of a sudden, solar is a lot cheaper. So a lot of people are looking at this. So, you know, the CFO's choice is, hey, I'm going to pay $6 million for my electricity, or, hey, I can spend about $20 million, one-time CapEx, and power up my own solar array. Well, that's where Cherry Beckert helps, because we can come on in, we can take a look at the parts and um, the makeup of that solar array and figure out how much is eligible for both federal and state incentives. And a rough target is, yeah, we're shooting for about half of that cash to come back to the operating company in about the first year, okay, upon grid connection. That is lucrative, that's compelling, and that's why we're talking today. Go ahead, Marty. Oops, sorry, let me go back. <laughs> yep. There you go. Okay, so let's just look at a quick income statement and how this can affect you know, the CFO's world. On the left, this is a summary of everything we're gonna talk about today on the investment tax credit side. So in this case, the manufacturer is gonna take advantage of ITCs, okay, and 45X, spend it about $20 million split between the solar system and the battery pack, which is very common. And you can see the 30% credits that are coming from the Inflation Reduction Act are applied. And then in this case, we're assuming they're getting a bonus credit of 10% because it's set up in an energy community, which is one of several bonus tiers. There's other bonus tiers as well. The most popular one is domestic content, and that's another 10%. But in this case, we're just assuming the energy community bonus credit. All right, that adds up to about $7.8 million in tax credits. And like Marty just said, they are not illiquid through direct pay or transferability into the tax credit market. You can liquidate those, okay? So that's part one. And then part two is the accelerated depreciation advantages that were introduced um, in the statutes. And it kind of speaks for itself, but the accelerated depreciation benefit, federal only, is about $2.8 million. Now, one thing, this is for a C-Corp, but many of our customers at Cherry Beckert are in pass-through companies, and that effective marginal rate is going to be much higher. Hence, the depreciation benefit can be much higher. But in this case, we're being conservative. So, Stepping back from the situation in a very simple uh, example here, about half of that CapEx 
can come back to the CFO in a very short period of time. And, you know, after you get that 50% back, you still own the asset for the duration of it, about 25 years, and you get the energy savings each year. Okay. Go ahead, Marty. So it's very lucrative. Okay. So, you know, how is Cherry Becker wanting to help our clients and how are we getting in there? Well, the big picture here is everybody's assuming that sustainability and carbon credits, my goodness, this is going to be a, a drag on not just my time and resources, but it's going to be an expense to the company. It's going to reduce my earnings, but that's really not true. The message we're trying to get out there is there's ways you can become more sustainable and reduce your carbon footprint and actually enhance profitability. So for that CFO that's under the gun in front of the board of directors or for a public earnings calls, that's really a wonderful message to be able to be very specific on your uh, carbon footprint activities and drive EPS. You can do both, okay? So just a few uh, pieces of the puzzle there. Well, obviously we have carbon accountants and they're gonna parachute into the client's company and go through the assets, go through the electricity, but more importantly, go through the supply chain. That's called scope three measurement and it gets very hairy. So we have a carbon footprint team and we're helping clients do this. Secondly, we have a very large R&D tax credit business. That's part of Marty's organization, but all of these companies in some form or fashion can drive R&D tax credits through these kinds of activities, okay? But then there's also some nuances. As you plan for your future CapEx, well, you can choose new sites for manufacturing and optimize further incentives across states, cities, and counties. And we have a group that will help you play these states and cities, you know, against each other for your business and help you get your best deal. Marty just talked about how we help do the application-based credits for 48C, and that's going to be talked about in this webinar. Thirdly, we can model the benefits just like that last slide. And then I think more importantly, we want to help operators figure out how to get to, in uh, the case of the federal contractors, net zero by 2050. Let's think about the long-term plan here. And as you go, let's optimize these credits for federal, states, and local all along the way. Okay, Marty. All right, thank you. And I would also just add on to that, to the extent you don't have a current tax liability, we can also help you get to uh, the marketplace appropriately to register these credits and sell them. So there's a lot we can do. And um, I think every day we're almost understanding more that we can do due to the fact that these um, incentives are so different than they were two years ago. All right. Absolutely. Okay, so we are aiming to be a one-stop shop and make this as easy as possible for the CFO office and the operators, the COOs and CEOs. Of course, on the far left, you all know that we are a CPA firm, PCAOB, and we have uh, over 2,000 professionals, and that is you know, the majority and the foundation of the business, okay? But we've layered in carbon accounting and reporting, and we have FSA certified carbon accountants to help remember California actually mandates an assurance provider in the public carbon reporting. So you have to both account for it and have an attestation. Thirdly, your choice of your digital platform to measure your greenhouse gases and your carbon footprint, it's really important. We partner very closely with Salesforce Net Zero and Microsoft. We're official solution partners, and we can both manage the implementation of that and the ongoing maintenance of these platforms. Fourthly, you've met Marty. He runs the TCIA practice, and that's really the, the, the main event today on this webinar. And then lastly, I just talked about site selection services, which can help you optimize all these state and local incentives as you go for your long-term plan. One-stop shop is the key. Okay, Marty. All righty. Thanks, Jason. Appreciate that. You're welcome. Okay, polling question two. Does your company need assistance establishing a carbon accounting uh, and yep. reporting program? Yep. And as you're thinking about answering this question, everybody, you know, key questions in your mind, are you part of the supply chain of a large manufacturer, you know, like, like a big auto? Are you selling into big retail? If so, the carbon questionnaires are coming. Are you public? Well, the SEC has published the guidance. Do you touch California in any way? 
And are you greater than 500 million? Do you operate in the EU? Are you a government contractor? All these are triggers for mandatory carbon reporting really starting next year. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, and honestly, that's just the beginning. When you begin that, then we continue to assess what else we can do to like bring down the cost and, and take a look from every other perspective as well. All right, um, very good. Okay, polling, uh, does your company need assistance? A small amount says yes, maybe is 34%, and I just assume that's will go up as knowledge is understood. Um, and we've become educated on all that. Well, thank you, Jason, very much. All right, uh, IRA, Inflation Reduction Act credit specific to manufacturing. So again, my colleagues, uh, Tim Doran and David Muamani are gonna speak uh, mostly on this and I may add a few comments while we go through, so I'll turn my camera off, but at the same time, David and Tim, or Tim in this case, why don't you take it away on the 48 scene? Yeah, absolutely, thank you, Marty. Um, just thinking about that slide, IRA credit specific to manufacturing. Um, these aren't the only credits available to manufacturers. And, and Jason talked about that, you know, a little bit in terms of solar. There are a whole host of different technologies in the Inflation Reduction Act. I just wanted to make sure we're being careful there. These are credits that are kind of only available to manufacturers, right? So these are ones that Congress targeted into the manufacturing space. And we're going to kind of talk through why that is and how that works. Um, you may have heard about this Section 48C um, uh, in the past or, or from other sources, or maybe you even caught it on a webinar. I'm hoping today to kind of take a little bit deeper dive into how it operates, what's required of a taxpayer to go about getting this, and then also some of the lessons that we've learned through the first round, and we'll, we'll talk about how that, how that happened a little bit too. Um, and then hopefully some key takeaways at the end, and then maybe a, a, a call to action and a sense of urgency, because there's a limited time window here, as Marty uh, addressed in the beginning. But Section 48C um, has ha has existed in the past. It, it came about about 10 years ago. And like many of uh, the different credits and incentives in the Inflation Reduction Act, this one was refreshed, and it was tweaked and modified and then expanded a little bit. Um, it's a it's an application based credit, um, and so it functions a little bit different than a lot of the federal tax credits that you might be used to, in that there is a limited pool of money that's been set aside, and that pool represents credits, not total expenditures. And we'll talk about a little bit how that's all calculated, but it's a pool of credits that are available to taxpayers who are ultimately approved and allocated a portion of those by the IRS. This gets a little bit interesting because the Department of Energy has its hand in it too. Um, but when Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, they set aside $10 billion to be allocated to these projects within this advanced energy project credit space. 40% of those of that of those dollars were earmarked specifically for projects in certain energy communities. And we have guidelines as to determine what an energy community is. And in fact, um, you, you can actually go onto the Department of Energy's website and pretty quickly get a general guideline as to whether or not your project might fall within one of those energy communities, they kind of have a Google map type setup where you can go in and put your address in and see whether you fall in. Um, this credit has a base rate of 6%, but as we've seen in so many of these credits uh, within the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirement that if met, juices that up to about 30%, well, to 30% uh, of your uh, qualified invested dollars. Um, and it, it's a pretty powerful credit. Now, last year, we had our first round of allocations. And so the first $4 billion of that total $10 billion pot was set aside. We had an application window that opened from the end of May to the end of July. And that application window was actually the first part of a multi-tiered application process that we'll talk about. And the first tier is producing a concept paper that meets some various requirements that the IRS has, uh, has provided in a notice um, that, that, that they're looking to look at, but it's also an opportunity to tell the story of what you're investing in um, and and why you should be allocated these credits. Once you've applied to that um, window and put your concept paper in, there's a long process we're going to walk through about how you get allocated that credit, but that happened last year. We $4 billion is in the process of being allocated. Letters are going out um, from the IRS uh, through this first quarter. I think they the IRS had announced they were going to try to get um, them out by, by March 31st. So, so we're almost at their deadline here. Um, but we have $6 billion left to allocate. And we do not have an affirmed deadline yet. Uh, but the expectation is that it's going to open up just like it did last year um, this summer. And once that window for concept papers is closed, there's no more application availability. So 
the, the, it, it's important that if this, if, if you hear something today that makes you think that you might qualify for, for this incentive, that you're you're talking to an advisor or you're looking into what's going on here because there's a there's an urgency here because there's a very limited time period to get your concept paper in. Um, and, and we'll walk through that. Marty, if you want to go to the next slide. Yeah, and if you don't mind, let me say it even more basically. If you're doing anything to your manufacturing facility and making any investment, give us a call. Let's talk it through and see if it can any way qualify because the, um, the categories here are three. They're for critical mineral projects. Uh, the manufacture of what I just like to call green widgets, but and that's very similar to what the old 48C was. But this catch-all provision of investments in your facility that have greenhouse gas emission reduction benefits of more than 20% is huge. And um, what Tim's going to go into this in more detail, we're also going to talk about what goes into those concept papers, what's required, and a little bit of how you tell the story the right way so that um, you're actually being specific. It's interesting because some information came out from the IRS and some of the things that were denied. And um, this is why you need an advisor. There's drop down menus in, in the portal and they would pick the wrong category of these three and describe a different project and then they get booted out and they would lose. And so um, there's just a lot of very specific things you can do and some really easy ways to blow it if you don't. And so I just wanna open it up to everybody. If they have any idea of any kind of investment they may be making, in their manufacturing facility to do anything. Let's just talk it through. Uh, maybe it'll generate a research credit for you. But beyond that, if I, I just want to, timing is, is so the essence, I would hate for anybody to lose out because they didn't they didn't just talk to somebody about it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you for that, Marty. Um, and, and, and that's a great segue into what are these three kind of categories um, that we're talking about. And I, and I think the one that Marty was speaking to specifically in terms of let's chat it through because there's a lot of breath to it is that number two one. Um, but the first category is a project that re-equips, expands, or establishes an industrial facility. And, and you'll see that language in both one and three. And I think that's important. It It's not just building something new. You're not just engaging in a new industry. You're not necessarily a startup or, or entering a new space. You could be uh, re-equipping or expanding something that you already have going on. So the process might have been there, but you're going to increase your capacity. Um, and, and, and that's true of both of those those categories of costs. And so um, I, I think that's an important, that, that, that also speaks to that breadth. Um, and, if, and if you have CapEx into what you're doing, um, you know, let's talk and see if, if, if you meet those qualifications. Um, so that first category is all about processing and refinery of critical minerals. There's a long list of those critical minerals um, that's referenced in the code. Um, and, and there's also even a catch-all um, within that um, provision as well to say that any other minerals that might be identified as critical minerals. So, uh, you know, Congress was really hoping to make sure that we we uh, bring on shore and expand what's already on shore in terms of our ability to develop these minerals that are used in all of these new and exciting green energy technologies, uh, you know, from solar panels to, to microgrid controllers. Um, the, the third category, we actually have a slide that's a little bit maybe easier to read on the next page, but, but that's also re-equipping, expanding, or establishing um, a manufacturing for the production or recycling of particular kind of buckets of components which are, or, or, or properties which are used in kind of the clean energy, renewable energy um, the space. And so there's another code section, which also like, there's a little bit of crossover between these two things, and you can only choose one or the other. Uh, David, my colleague is going to talk a little bit more about 45X, but this is, this is kind of like 45X, but a little bit broader. So as you can see, there's a lot of different potential widgets or components that you could be manufacturing that kind of serve this green energy space that might fit into there. And then there are some categories within here that are even broader. I'll point to like the property designed to produce energy conservation technologies, including residential, commercial, and industrial applications. That's a pretty broad bucket of things that you could be making that might be conserving technologies. We've talked to a variety of different manufacturers that are doing some pretty unique and interesting things that are replacing older technologies and components um, in buildings and homes and equipment that, uh, you know, I think I think this was purposely left broad so that we could capture and, and let people like that tell those stories and, and get these dollars and in investment uh, in the form of federal tax credit to, to provide incentive to continue to build and expand um, that type of work. You want to go back one real quick, Marty? Oh, yeah, sure. The second bucket. So the second bucket um, is, the, is the really broad one. And, and this is kind of, 
we don't care really what you're doing. Are you doing it in a way that's reducing carbon output, that you're reducing energy expenditure and that you're, you know, you're, you're being more clean and green. And so are you investing in equipment to re-equip an existing industrial or manufacturing facility um, that, you, that that involves lower zero carbon process heat systems? Maybe you're adding carbon capture. So your industrial process was producing a lot of carbon and now you're capturing it to either utilize or to store and sequester. Um, are you increasing your energy efficiency, taking waste out of your process? Um, and then once again, within this broader bucket, we have even another broader bucket, which says any other industrial technology that reduces greenhouse gas. And so this is a really powerful provision and, and, and it speaks directly to Marty's point, which is, you know, if, if you've got something going on, if you're, if you're spending CapEx and you're getting more efficient, there's, there's potentially an opportunity here for you. Okay, so you want to do this one or we already? No, we can cover it real. I think yeah. we kind of talked to this actually. We can we can skip to the next one. I kind of walked through that. This is um, the uh, the critical mineral minerals that we talked to as well. So these are any non fuel mineral element substance or material that has a high risk of supply chain disruption and serves an essential function. And there is a as I mentioned, there's a there's a list of uh, critical materials and minerals that's published annually that you can go and check and see if maybe you're producing, refining one of these minerals that, that fits this category. And for those watching the slide presentation, I just realized that I renumbered them in different orders on the first one compared to like later on. So David or Tim, thanks for your slides. And sorry to the audience for confusing one, two, and three as three, two, one. All right. yeah, that's all right. <laughs> there's there's three buckets. That's the important take. Yeah, I think. exactly. All right. The all right so let's, let's, Here we go. This is the most let's important. Let's get into this application process. Yeah, logistics. Yeah, so I talked about this a little bit. So we had this first window. Um, we're waiting on the second round. A, a couple interesting things. So one of the things that we've heard um, is that there were somewhere around $45 billion in applications for that first $4 billion of, of money. Um, it, but the expectation is there's not going to be nearly that much applications going on for the $6 billion. So this second round, there's going to be a lot more money in play, and we think there are going to be far fewer applications, which means the opportunity to potentially go back and, and, and take advantage of this credit is probably going to be even greater than it was in the first round. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about takeaways, so I don't want to jump too far ahead. But I think we also learned some, some really interesting things about who is getting qualified, and I'm not for sure that it's intuitive or who you might think. And so I want to walk through that because I think there are probably a lot of people on this call who might say, well, I'm not putting into place, you know, a $2 billion facility and that, you know, they're probably not looking at something like what I'm doing. And I, and I don't think that's actually the case. Um, so, so really want to talk about that, but there's really two kind of primary steps and we can break it down into to, to some more sequential things as we go here. But the first one is submitting that concept paper. If you don't submit a concept paper, you can't go on to the next steps. Conversely, if you submit a concept paper, and the DOE doesn't give you a thumbs up, you can still go forward and put together an application to the, it's, it's actually a joint application. It does go to the DOE and there's a portal we'll talk about, but then it also ultimately goes to the IRS to get final blessing and allocation. But if you do not submit, I think the important point here is if you do not submit that concept paper, you're out. You can't go forward any farther. And so you have a, a short two month window this summer to do that. What we think will be this summer, which would in the summer last time. So, so there we go. We're required to submit that concept paper. What's interesting is it was called the exchange portal um, already in just a very short amount of time. Uh, the IRS has already implemented some new tech and, and I believe it's now called the 48 C portal, but they've actually migrated from that exchange portal. It's the same thing. There, there's an online portal that you're going to go in to submit all of this stuff. And that's going to uh, allow you to register um, yourself as a taxpayer and, and go through the various steps that they have uh, uh, through that process. Um, th this paper, as I mentioned before, it's designed to kind of tell your story. You have a proposed project, and that's that's important to it, propose, right? So one of the questions we get is, hey, I put this into service last year. Um, you know, can I go after this credit? There are some credits that are um, not retrospective, but you know, you'll you'll take advantage of them on your uh, when you file um, your return in the subsequent year after the tax year in which you place it into service. This is one of those things that it has to be a prospective investment. So you cannot 
place whatever it is you're trying to get a credit on into service until after you've received that allocation letter from the IRS. If you do so, you're no longer eligible for the credit. Uh, and we'll talk about a little bit of the window that you have to do so once you've gone through this application process. So there is a little bit of timing. It's not terrible. Um, you know, what we've heard is that, um, and what we've seen is that the the DOE was giving thumbs up on concept papers that were that were submitted in the summer by the end of the fall. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the IRS is expected to be issuing allocation letters somewhere around now. Um, and so that timing isn't even quite a year, but it is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about what you might have going on. Um, after reviewing the concept paper, the DOE issues a letter to the taxpayer that it, I said thumbs up or thumbs down, encouraging or discouraging the taxpayer from submitting an application for those 48C credits. Um, but all, all taxpayers can submit it regardless of whether you get that encouragement. Um, you then submit a second application kind of uh, in addition to that concept paper to the DOE. And then the DOE reviews that, makes sure that one, you've met all the requirements of the, of the code section and the regulation and notices that have come out, and then makes a determination as to whether or not to recommend you uh, to the IRS to get that allocation. Yeah, and I, I just walked through that first bullet point. And then the IRS makes a, uh, no, not the slide, just the, the bullet point, sorry, Marty. The IRS makes a final determination regarding the acceptance and then issues you that allocation uh, of your credits. So it, it's a it, it's a little wonky here in, in terms of how this works, but you're going to get, um, uh, you know, a letter that you're getting allocated a credit. And then there are certain certification requirements. Uh, they, they get a little bit technical, but a lot of them are like, did you get the proper permitting that you needed to get in order to be placing this stuff into service? And you have a window of time of two years after you receive that IRS allocation letter to let the DOE know that you've you've passed all those hurdles. Um, and once you've done that and the DOE has confirmed that, and you do this through the portal, um, the DOE then provides a confirmation to the taxpayer and the IRS that yes, the, these, these certification requirements have been met. The IRS then provides the taxpayer certification letter. Upon receiving that certification letter, you now have a two-year runway to let the DOE know that your project has been placed into service. Once you place that project into service and you've notified them, you can then claim on the return for the tax year in which you place the project into service, your credit amount. And then, as we mentioned, the, the timeline has yet to be announced, but we're expecting it this summer. Okay, so what's the Department of Energy looking for? Uh, there's kind of five categories, right? Commercial viability. Uh, are you creating domestic jobs? What's the environmental impact of what you're doing? So, um, you know, th that's kind of a holistic approach to, obviously, if you're you're qualifying for this, it's, it's something um, green and efficient and clean. But I think they're still looking to kind of tier these and scale these and say, what's what's the true impact of this? Are, are you are you are you meeting the thresholds? Or are you really providing a, a, a significant impact to the environment? Um, and then four, are, are you doing something that's technologically innovative? And then five, what's your project timeline? Are you going to be able to get this thing into service within the timeline that we just talked about? And I would say um, it's interesting because this is truly a collaborative. Um, engagement to do a concept paper between Cherry Beckert and the company. I mean, clearly commercial viability, the company is going to understand what that is, but we want to make sure that we're articulating that well. Domestic job creation, not very different from what we do with a lot of our new markets tax credit projects when we're trying to assess what that job creation is as we're looking for allocation from that. Um, technological innovation, not too different from what we do in our R&D studies and use some of our engineers and the team to make sure that that's described correctly. Environmental impact, um, we'll just think about working with the company's potentially sustainability officer or whomever may be best to speak with that. And project timeline, again, we want to make sure it's both realistic, but in, in the future, so uh, it, it falls within the line, guidelines of, of getting this. But um, these can be a lot of work, but they're certainly worth a lot of money. And um, again, this is something that uh, we're more than willing to talk about with you. And and we're working on these concept papers, too, with... with um, clients for, I would say a fairly reasonable fee. We're kind of like making it as an investment in them. And then we'll, we'll work more to see what happens after they get the thumbs up or thumbs down. No, and I think that's a great, 
point, Marty, too, that, you know, we, we, what we found is we, <laughs> we've been able to leverage a lot of our team's experiences and, and we, we can speak DOE, we can speak R&D and we can speak IRS. And, and I think that helps on these concept papers. And to your point you made earlier, I think, you know, we, we, what, what they've said they've had issues with, I think part of it was not being able to speak the IRS language. And so we'll get there, but th these next few slides, we can kind of move through fairly quickly. This just kind of breaks down. What do we mean by each of these categories and what specifically are we looking at? So commercial viability, what's your project plan? W where are you putting it? Do you, are there any foreseen permitting issues? Do you have a sound business plan? Do you have a management plan? What are the types of risks that are out there? And these are the things where you get to, one, address all of these things that you're required to address in your concept paper, but also tell your story and, and, and present a, a strong case for why you should be allocated these credits. And, and Marty talked about this, domestic job creation, how many jobs are you creating? What's gonna be the impact to the community? Um, and in our team, we, we have a we have a group of folks actually that are, are very specifically focused on a lot of these efforts, uh, uh, even outside of this particular space in terms of going after, um, uh, you know, state level credits and incentives and, and understanding what, what the impacts on, on communities are to new investment. We talked about environmental impact. Yeah, I mean, this this goes well along with a lot of what Jason was talking about, too, from some yep, of the parts. Absolutely. Had. There's definitely it, everything is kind of focused in a similar method, it's in a similar direction. It's just a matter of what we're articulating for which particular incentive or compliance initiative. And the same thing with technological yeah. innovation. Are you producing something new? Are you improving something? You know, uh, uh, what what kind of special uh, uh, facts and circumstances are you bringing to the market? And I, I see my second spelling error in all this as I went through these with a little T at the end of issues, but that's okay. All right. <clears throat> and then I mentioned project timeline. I think the big thing here is, are, are you going to be able to get this thing placed into service within a reasonable time frame, and also meet the requirements uh, that are already in the code itself in terms of when you have to certify the project and when you have to place it into service? <clears throat> and this just summarizes what we just talked about here. The prevailing wage, I'll talk about these briefly. You know, this comes up over and over and over again because it's such an important part to virtually everything in the Refl Inflation Reduction Act. I think it was an important, this is this is an important reason and 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 component to why I think the, the IRA even got passed, right, was was putting this in as a, as a requirement to getting all of these um, huge incentives. Um, and and that's that the 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 way the workers that are engaged in these projects and building out these facilities or installing these equipment uh, across the board are being paid prevailing wages as determined by the Department of Labor and that's a uh, labor class and geographic class analysis and there are tables that you can go to and figure out what those wages are but it's important to know that this touches um, every single person who who works on the project, whether it be a contractor, employee, or subcontractors, anybody that's that's a labor on the project has to meet these requirements. Same thing with the apprenticeship requirements. A percentage of the total la labor hours have to be performed by apprentices. Um, for both of these though, and we won't go into detail for purposes of this discussion, for both of these, there are exceptions, caveats, ability to cure, um, but but they are important requirements. And, and it's important to have someone who knows what they're talking about, help you make sure you're meeting these. Yeah, I think most important thing is like this is another service that um, due to the Inflation Reduction Act, they apply to so many of the credits that it's something that you're going to have to be looking at for all of them. All right. Yeah, so we, we've mentioned this a couple of times. Now. These are some of the common issues um, that the IRS and DOE uh, actually put put a published a paper on that they saw, um, you know, and that number one there was insufficient detail um, provided. And so uh, maybe you maybe you had uh, an investment that would have otherwise qualified, but you didn't give enough information about it um, in your concept paper, or you didn't show how you met um, uh, the workforce and community engagement plan that 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 Congress wanted you to talk about, um, or you didn't meet the requirements of the data sheet provided by the DOE, um, and and that that's you know even further enhanced by the one below. And a lot of it was just lack of clear description description or even selecting the wrong project category when you when you went into the portal and, and filled out and and submitted your concept paper. I think a lot of people who did it on their own, who didn't have the experience from some of the firms that worked on 48C 12 years ago, just filled out some very basic things and it was easy for the DOE to reject it. There's work to do here, but it's not the whole thing. 
the real work is in the final application, but you really got to, you have to put a good, a good faith effort into explaining what it is. Um, I also have a feeling that some of the projects in the energy communities probably had a preference due to the fact that some of it's withheld just for them, but okay. Sorry. I keep interrupting. Continue. No, it's great. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marty. Yeah. Uh, so this is a big one too, right? Proposed investment included costs not eligible to be, eligible to be included. And so, um, you know, there, there, we talked about some of those criterion um, that, that we're placing before that, that's, that there is an important analysis to do to say, what am I doing and what am I spending my dollars on that would be qualified costs that would be eligible costs for purposes of calculating this 48C credit? And what might I be spending money on that could even be related or tangentially related that doesn't actually qualify for purposes of the credit? And to the extent that um, you you overcalculated the cost or you included equipment and materials or buildings or things that wouldn't otherwise qualify for the, the credit, that was also a problem that popped up. Uh, we talked about the um, either not getting your permits or or not being able to place it in service in the designated time frame. Um, and then the inability to demonstrate that that they um, that it met some of those other categories that we walked through. I'm going to start moving these faster than you can talk because we got a lot more to get to, and we don't. Yes, yes. All right, and then I've already said. And this we too. talked about this here. Like, no official date's been given yet, but it's going to happen this year, and um, it's just important. Please think about it now. Please call us or whomever your advisor may be. It's important for you to take a look at it. All right, polling question three: Are you or your company considering upgrading or expanding your manufacturing facilities? that increase efficiencies or in any sense, may update your uh, facilities. Okay, so just jumping ahead while people fill this thing out, we're gonna get to uh, 45X. We have a few 45X projects and they're pretty cool. And as I was talking about, it's a whole new concept in um, production tax credits uh, where it's not involving the production of energy and selling it back to the grid, but rather production of goods and selling those to unrelated parties. And it's a matter of what those particular goods are or critical minerals too. Um, but anyway, David, take a minute to introduce yourself a little bit more and then we'll get moving. Uh, yeah, thanks, Marty. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about section 45X. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my background is in the renewable energy tax credit space. Um, and then when the Inflation Reduction Act came around, I kind of expanded to all the new technologies uh, that were incorporated in that legislation. And then, as soon as this pulls over, we'll dive right into 45X. 45X is a per unit tax credit uh, for each component domestically manufactured and produced uh, of a renewable energy asset. Um, the credit amount is actually varies by the type of component that's being produced and manufactured domestically. And the eligible components are on the next slide. We have a list of an exhaustive list of what they are, but things such as solar grade polysilicone, PV wafer, solar modules, inverters, and as you can see for the credit rate, they're all different. Uh, for polysilicone, it's based on the kilograms. For modules, uh, it's based on the watt per DC. Others are watt per AC. So it's different for each specific component. Uh, and we have additional components on the next slide. Yep, and this is more of the same, just a few more of the eligible components. Um, as Tib mentioned, critical minerals. Uh, there is a fairly exhaustive list that you can find, so we didn't have space to list them all out. Uh, but we'll get into that a little bit later because it functions a little bit differently than the other components uh, or the other other way the tax credits work for this section. Um, so the code specifically defines each eligible component um, and the definitions that they give are fairly technical. Um, so, for example, we have an inverter here, a, a convert, a commercial inverter is one that is suitable for utility or commercial scale application. And it has to be, have a rated output of 208, 480, 600, or 800. And the capacity cannot be less than 20 kilowatts or not greater than 125. And for each eligible component, so not just inverters, there is the specific language for that component for the technical qualifications that it needs to meet to be eligible for 45X. Okay, so this is eligible for components that were manufactured and sold after December 31st, 2022. Um, there is a phase out for this credit. So starting in 2030, you'll only be eligible for 75% of the credit rate. And then it's 25% each year until we hit 2033 when you get to zero. Um, if you are at a facility where you receive 48C for that facility, where the components are being manufactured, you are not also eligible to receive 45X. 
Um, so that is one thing we want to note here, especially if we're talking about 48C. But also, if you submit a 48C application and unfortunately do not get an allocation of credit, but you are manufacturing component 45X, not all is lost. You could still be eligible for another potential credit. Um, and these credits are also transferable and eligible for direct pay. And one important thing to note on this is that direct pay eligibility is typically for tax-exempt organizations, but for 45X, as a regular tax-paying organization, you can still see direct pay for the first five years. Um, so that is a really cool feature of this. It's one of the few sections in the uh, IRA that allows this for non-tax exempt uh, entities to receive direct pay. And just for anybody who's observing this, you know, production tax credits, unlike investment tax credits, which you get at one time when you place something in service, you're getting these over a long period of time as your activities continue over years. And so it, it could be more beneficial than, than 48C in the end, right? Depending on what your, what your output was. Yep. And I think one of the things we've helped clients with is kind of looking at that benefit from both what the qualified expenditure would be for 48C and your potential credit. And then we take, you know, the projected production and sales of these components you're manufacturing and see which credit over the long run is going to be more valuable to you. Okay. So the related party rules do apply. So for you to generate a section 45X credit, you must sell that component that you've manufactured to an unrelated party. Um, the one caveat here is that it's not the 80% ownership, it's only 50%. Uh, so it, for it to be, be an unrelated party, it has to be less than 50% for that to qualify as an unrelated party. And there is not that additional carve out uh, for insurance companies with respect to 45X. Yeah, this is essentially an anti-abuse rule, right? To the extent like you have components that didn't sell, you can't create another company on the side with a different name and sell it to the other one and generate a credit. Um, so, all right. Yep, and then, so for the critical mineral aspect, it's a little different. So for the other components like inverters, batteries, solar modules, that is based on the production of that particular component uh, once it is sold. For critical minerals, it's 10% of the cost incurred to produce this. So if you have a $100,000 cost to produce uh, titanium, for example, your credit would be $10,000. Um, the list, as I mentioned, is exhaustive. A few high-level ones, we have aluminum, we have zinc, titanium, cobalt, nickel. Those are a few of the critical minerals, but the list is about 30 or 40 items long and it's updated annually. Uh, so if you're interested to see if, you know, you're doing one of these things that could qualify, there's a list out there on the IRS website for you. And another, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, this slide. Uh, so a few points here, uh, as we mentioned, if you claim 48C, you also would not be eligible uh, to receive 45X. Um one really cool thing about 45X is that if you're at a facility where you're manufacturing multiple eligible components, you can actually receive the tax credit for both components being manufactured. So if you're making solar cells and solar modules in the same facility, you would get the credit for the cells, and then you also get the credit for the modules. So you can kind of vertically integrate these items together to receive the maximum tax credit. Okay, so as I mentioned, the 45 credit is a sum of all eligible components. Um, these components, as we mentioned earlier, must be produced in the United States uh, or its territories to be eligible. Uh, and it only applies to components that are sold. So just because you manufactured all these solar panels, if you haven't actually sold them, you're not going to get the credit until the point when which they sell. Um, and then the related party rules, as we had mentioned, and I think the last point is kind of something we've already touched on as well, where you have to sell it to an unrelated party. And that kind of applies as well in the global context. Like if you're a global entity and you're selling it to your distributor somewhere uh, outside the U.S., that's still your related party, even though they're foreign. It's later until they uh, until they make that third party sale. All right. Yeah. So what does this really mean in dollars? So we walked through a, a basic example of kind of what it could mean to you financially. So. If you're a company that's making solar modules, obviously, you know, not everyone is doing that. So it's a little bit niche, but let's say that you are and you're producing 500 megawatts of capacity with those solar panels per year. 
So we would convert that number into watts because that's what the credit rate is based on. So we that 500 megawatts is 500 million watts. So that 500 million, we multiply by the credit rate of 0.7 cents per watt. And then if we assume that they sell 100% of the product that they have, they would end up generating a credit of $35 million in year one uh, for that sold component. And again, that is eligible for direct pay for tax paying entities, not just taxes and entities. And then if we assume production began in 2025, and then taking into account the phase out, which I mentioned earlier, beginning in 2030, over the lifetime that this credit is you know, applicable, you can receive over $215 million uh, in credit. So we're not talking, you know, th these numbers can be fairly large. Uh, we've seen numbers quite much larger than this, uh, to be honest. So it is a definitely, if you are someone that is making these components, a very beneficial tax credit to take care of. Uh, take. Okay, and then we have recently gotten some new regs that have come out. Um, this first point that we want to uh, mention here is that we receive kind of a detailed information as what actually constitutes manufacturing component. So let's, in a very simple way, if you have a battery that's shipped to your manufacturing facility and all you do is make cosmetic changes and then you sell that component, you are not eligible to take the credit because uh, you did not actually do anything that was functionally important to make ensuring that this technology worked. Uh, so that is one thing that we saw come from new legislation. Going to the next slide, Marty. Um, a couple other points. We got uh, a new definition uh, as to what is, which excludes a uh, partial transformation. I think well, the most important piece that we got from these updates is we got clarification that subcomponents of the overall component. So if you're making a battery, subcomponents that go into it, they do not necessarily need to be domestically sourced for the overall component to be eligible uh, for 45X. So that was a key piece of legislation that we got because that was a little murky area uh, prior to receiving that knowledge. Um, and yes, our last poll question of the day, are you interested in learning more about what forty? what is eligible under 45X? And again, this was highly technical in terms of how quickly we went through a lot of this stuff, but if you feel that you are producing and selling or plan to produce any of these critical minerals or any of these component pieces that might you might consider to be part of like going into renewables, just talk it through and let's make sure you don't misunderstand it. And we don't so that uh, figure out if you do qualify. And most importantly, as David said, if you, if you, if you think it qualifies potentially for both 48 C and 45 X, try them both. I mean, 48 C is something that you can do right now from a time crunch perspective um, with this, uh, with these uh, concept papers being due at some point later this year, but all is not lost, as David said. Um, it's a really good opportunity to try again. And you don't even try at that point. You just file the credit after you start to do that. So 45X is, is a little less complex to claim. Okay. So with that said, I think I'm almost at a point to thank everybody for being here because we're, we're done. But um, let's just leave it to the last point because I know this thing's over. The most important thing, monetization at the end here, which we talked about, these credits, even if you can't use them, you can sell them. And um, that's probably a really big area that's going to be something we're going to cover on a future um, webcast. With that said, everybody, I just want to thank you so much for joining today. Try to get done at the hour. And so that hour is right now. So I really want to ask you um, to come back for the other ones that we um, we do. And um, I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody.